Hello, Svetlana. Good morning. Nice to see you again, again from the Ukraine. How is it going? It's going really well. How about, how are you? I am doing very well too. It is beautiful times in beautiful Hamburg. The sun is shining all the time and there's still enough uh, rain clouds to cool you down just when it gets a bit too hot. It's really hot in Ukraine, actually. I wish we had some rain. Oh, in which part of you're, you're in Kiev, right? No, I'm in um, I'm in the I'm in the south of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's a city called Nikolaev, um, ah. somewhere close to close Odessa. to Odessa and Crimea. Yeah, so yes, yeah. Odessa is often uh, a place with a lot of sun. So yeah, maybe you'll get. But you even got some color. I can see that too. So you've been outside probably every now and then. Anyway, Svetlana, I want to see your smart moves. What do you have uh, presented for us today? Okay, so let me let me share. Oh, Mr. Nigel Short. Oh, Mr. Timman. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to, before I like reveal today's topic, I wanted to ask if you're if you recognize this position. Poof. Oh, so this is a position which you probably should recognize. Oh. <laughs> actually, do, do you recognize it? Actually, I don't think I do. Feel like a failure already, please. No, help. no, no. That's no. That's great. That's, that is great that you don't recognize it because, um, because that that means um, there will be a lot of things, a lot of things to look at here and to learn. Uh -oh. uh, it's it's a it's a classic. It's a it's a pretty classic example. Um, and uh, since you don't know it, we might as well actually look through the whole game. But uh, perfect. So we can actually probably start from the whole game and not just from this position. Okay. All right, go for it. I mean, okay. I guess uh, for you at home, uh, even if you know this, let's just look at this game because it already looks intimidating at this position. So let's just go for it. Yeah, but I'm curious. I, I don't want to spoil the whole the whole game just yet <laughs> because the what how the way it ended, the final like maneuver here is is very amazing. Okay. Okay, I'll show it to you from the opening. Um, oh, you know what? Yeah. I recognize it now. You recognize you suddenly did. <laughs> I suddenly did. I suddenly did. I know the technique. I won't spoil anything for you at home uh, who might have not uh, seen this position yet. But now I just remember it just made click in my brain and I remember this position. I am sorry. Yeah. OK. Anyway. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it's a nice final maneuver, right? I feel like there's uh, it's a very uh, it's a very like classical example. Of, True. Uh, yeah. Okay. So um, we'll still look at it from the opening. Um, there's still some some interesting moments that happened here. Um, it's a game between Nigel Short and Dion Thiemann. It was played in 1991, as I can see, and um, it became a classic because of uh, its very unusual like final maneuver. Uh, which happened uh, with the piece you least expected from, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we will not we will not spoil it just yet. It's, and, pro uh, it's uh, probably already uh, <laughs> clear to everybody. Very by clear. Now. It's very clear. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's, but we it's, still give yeah, we'll it, still give some time at the end for people to try to solve it. Good idea. Yeah. Okay, so it started with the Alakine defense. Um, How do you like this defense yourself, Alekine? Actually, yeah, I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask you if um, have, you, have you have you played as black? I'm super happy if anybody is playing Alekine against me. I have pretty good results against this. It just happened two times already, but um, oh, with white. So you love it with white. I like it with white. Yeah, I I cannot play Alekine myself. What, what, li what line do you play as white? Uh, absolutely bonkers line. I call it the bonkers attack. So if you, <laughs> let's just take a look at it. So from uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't play. Um, I would of course attack with c4. Knight goes to to b6. Then I play a4. Oh, <laughs> and then normally okay. a five, and then the fun begins because I will play b4. Oh, and then you can take because it's just a hanging pawn, right? There's really no threat at all. And now I play bishop b2 okay. because I have to, otherwise, I, I cannot play a5, but in the next move, I can play f5, mm -hmm. a5. Mm -hmm. And this is where the trouble for black sometimes begins. I actually only want to force the knight to exactly to d7, 
which normally happens like this. Yeah, you play d6 or d5 or something. Then it's I play a5. Typical move for the other And then d7. And this is, and then I'm just happy when I push my pawn to e6. And for me, this is normally the game decider. So now I have like this weird variation where I'm having this Nordic Gambi in a second, exactly. So now my bishop goes to um, d3 oh. before I push the, the queen there, yeah. Oh, this is actually really interesting. Um, I There's probably some ways in which black doesn't have to go for this. Absolutely, but, yes. But I see why you would like it as white. I think I would prefer this as white too. It, so, it it is quite nice. Uh, I think I think uh, yeah. In blitz games, for example, it's, here it's fun. Um, maybe like um, maybe black doesn't have to play if I but if I've if I've makes some sense. But I think there is there are points at which um, black can play a little more actively. Like maybe instead of playing d six, play something like d five. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. D five is a bit better. I I completely agree. Now, nonetheless, I can still push forward to c5 in most right. cases. Oh, not a5. C5. No, no a5 think, is... Because if you play a5 now... Exactly, yeah. So c5, and then black doesn't have to go to d7 anymore. And yeah, and yeah, I can also live with this position. It's it's uh, fun to, to advance in this territory too. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, sorry for this short short excourse, but I, I really enjoy playing against the Aliakin because, yeah, normally I attack yeah. the knight until it uh, it gets annoyed and yeah <laughs> yeah i've actually um i've actually played the alakine as black uh, before <laughs> and i played it um it's not a main opening of course because you can't have the alakine as your main opening but um <laughs> i played it at some very serious events and my teammates were were sometimes very surprised they're like what is this like do you mm. like it's it's because it's um at like a higher level it's considered like dubious right yeah and um yeah or it's like shows that you have no respect for your opponent you know it's like what, whoa what is it goes this far really no, oh, well I... no respect for your opponent is if yeah. you come back to g8 it's, <laughs> a, it's a real line it's a real line <laughs> the no respect for your opponent line yeah yeah <laughs> um yeah so this is it but um wow so uh yeah actually i have a I have a really good score in the alakine like probably <laughs> like an 80 percent or something which is good for black so i w i when we have a blitz game later uh, uh in, in private i will play alakin uh, i will be white sure. and you will be black and then we sure, will see sure. then we will see anyway yeah. I, don't, I don't play it as often <laughs> anymore but uh but yeah there are some lines in which white is just clearly better and uh of course, it makes sense, but I think it's not so bad. It's not as bad as people think it is. I agree. So, I agree. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I think me and you both share a passion for not learning theory and <laughs> and being totally. a bit lazy in that sense. So this is this is one of those things that you can maybe surprise your opponent with. And um, and yeah, so let's get to the rest of the game. Uh, and you see, some serious players are still playing the Alakine, so it's not. Yeah been trying to convince people for so long that the alakine is not so bad it's <laughs> it's a decent opening um so uh the game no, definitely it's true yeah it's not the most ambitious setup for white as far as i as far as i know there are some ways to um try to take up more of the center mm -hmm. uh but still white is doing quite well and um the game um just continues with both players developing their pieces. And um, let's say this is one of the moments that I wanted to get to. Mm -hmm. um, in this type of position, uh, do you want, do you think you would rather exchange queens or keep the queens on the board as white? <sighs> what a good question this is. So now the other question I'm asking, uh, 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 yeah. Uh, don't I? Hmm. Oh, maybe not. Oh, this is tricky. So I'm just thinking of bishop taking d5, and I'm asking myself, do I? No, I don't win a pawn. It says, don't I win a pawn? Let's if I see. just take the bishop on d5? Take. I don't know. I just like. And you want to take the spot? Yeah. You can do this. This is one of the this is one of the variations, uh -huh. right? Uh, but uh, after something like bishop e six, uh, first of all, it's difficult to think about uh, like a, 
a good spot yeah. where they can go. And um, it's definitely something to consider. Let's say like going for this type of um, for this type of position. And uh, now, basically, Black kind of um, solved some of his opening problems, which he was a little down in development, and um, has huh. the bishop pair. But instead, true, you get a true. you get a pawn. So I have a feeling it balances out. Maybe you would rather play as white. Yeah, or... yeah, I would even rather play as black here. So the more I think about this position, I mean, this is a nice attack with the with the bishops on on the queen side so yeah i get i understand i don't think uh, yeah this is a good move for for white to take there oh it's it's possible it's a, it's a matter of choice uh, mm. but uh, but yeah so but back to your question do i want to exchange the queens yes or no <laughs> so i always like to think that white might have a chance to play on with the queen sneak in sometime on h6 with the bishop and the queen is somewhere on h4 it's already because we've seen the final like the introductory position so you I, already know where we're headed i get you but that's that is a general idea of, of right. mine when i have white so in this case um exchanging the queens i i would try to avoid it but then of course avoiding the exchange of queens is is annoying because there's no real I don't see a good move at the moment maybe bishop c4 I don't know right no. yeah bishop c4 is what was played in the game huh. and uh I think uh, you are right about not exchanging queens uh because if we do let's say you capture captures back and uh one of the things to think about when you're just exchanging pieces in general I feel like we have had a lesson on exchanging pieces we actually did is when you have more space you don't usually want to trade yeah that helps your opponent have have more space for the rest of them so right now and in the alakine defense you always as white have more space and uh right now this was one of those moments where white didn't uh, didn't need to didn't need uh -huh. to take and yeah this type of position i think is totally fine as black as as black yeah because you have this new weakness on a4 to attack mm -hmm. and you don't have too many problems anymore because you, you can just develop all of your pieces without any trouble. So not exchanging gotcha. is much better, but this bishop c4 move is actually something that's difficult to find because, you know, you might think about avoiding the trade of queens, like retreating, something like this, but then you run into some maybe knight of fours. Yeah. In the so um, bishop c4 was actually the harder move to find. And uh, the reason is this knight b6 move, which I'm not sure if you calculated I didn't. Uh, this one, but this was uh, kind of the the problem with bishop c4 not the problem but it's something that might dis might have discouraged some people from finding bishop c4 and now uh we play this move such as b3 Ooh. and do you see what the idea is behind it b3 oh uh, yeah yeah but only because you just mentioned it do you see what the idea is behind <laughs> it <laughs> that's that's so fine that's still fine as long as you can <laughs> see it eventually so it's bishop a3 is the threat which um forces black to take take and uh this is an interesting pawn structure which i feel like you don't see too too often True. because uh that's usually something we really don't want to have you know three um like uh those three isolated pawns double yeah. pawns um they're all far away from each other usually not something you would love to have as white uh but there are some other positional advantages to this position uh, and we will see how what white did to make use of them. So after rook e8, um, what would you play here as white? I think I would probably follow up with bishop a3 since I already um, made this plan. So first of all, I would attack the black queen, then I would uh, develop my last minor piece, and I would connect both rooks. I think it's uh, fine. But okay. then again, it also looks good on g5, but I think a3, I, I, I like a3. I am wondering if after this, I can actually just grab your pawn. Wow, that is so naughty. Bird attack? I'm not sure if you do. That is so naughty. That is really, 
that's a computer move. <laughs> it, it, I mean, I don't know. I just, I see the point. It is true, yeah. I mean, I, I well, my, uh, the idea would be bishop f8 maybe. But okay, it's, it's, so you just traded the bishops though. Yeah, yeah. and then I get, uh, this is also not good, yeah. That's a double pawn. Doesn't help. Doesn't help. No, you're right. It's not so good. Oh, uh -huh. Bishop B3 is, is not the move, but definitely that was the, that was the original idea of B3 for sure. Mm. But there's uh, there's a stronger positional positional move here. You need to. So I still would love to move the bishop, though. I think well, Bishop G4 G5 is that okay? Bishop G5 should be okay. I okay. have a feeling that after Bishop G5, Black probably just completes development. Yeah. And yeah, that's yeah, that's but it's not point. like this crunching move you're looking for. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay, now I have to think for a sweet second. One moment, please. Hmm. Um. Well, how about getting the queen to h4 earlier? To queen then. To good idea for later, right? But yeah. Remember, what is black trying to do? Try to think about it from your opponent's perspective too. What is black's next move? Black only pretty much has one move that they're going to play next. So is it this bishop to d7? Yeah, I, there's no other way for black to develop. Oh, black. so it is rook d1? Exactly. It oh is rook gosh, no, I wouldn't um, have found that. Yeah, it's it's a pretty difficult move Crazy. to um, to like find. But once you you know once you walk through the steps, like what does black want to do? What is their development plan? Yeah, it's uh, it's actually quite an effective strategy to have during the game. Is just to like cut off all of your opponents. It's um, all of your opponent's ideas because now yeah. like look at the position as black and what are you going to play? How are you going to develop? It's very true. It reminds me of normally when you are blocking a uh, castling of the opponent. So this is kind of, uh, yeah, because there is no real move. Uh, black cannot even move b6. Yeah, it's fun. That's nice. Right. It's a very good right. move. Yeah, yeah, very. Yeah, it's effective. a very, it's a very good positional idea and uh, just a good um, strategy to have when you're playing, preventing, preventing essentially what your opponent wants to do, mm -hmm. because you'll find that it's it's really annoying when you are the opponent and all of your ideas just get, um, just get canceled. How do you know when when to use what strategy? You just get a feel for it at one point because after all, if you think about it for a while, it's probably really very straightforward that this is a move which makes a lot of sense. Although it goes against the norm of trying to yeah, get the last minor piece out, connect the rooks, as I said already. And it, yeah, this is just a move. Yeah, I guess I just answered my own question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sometimes there is no rush with those with those things because your bishop can get out at any point. Yeah. And it's more important to prevent the opponent's idea of getting the bishop to c6. And um, then you can carry on with any with any plan you want. I understand. How, like how you know when to use this and when not to use this. Maybe sometimes when you see that your opponent only has like one working like idea, one way of developing their pieces, you can try to see if you can prevent that one way because it's going to make it hard for them to come up with yeah. something else. So yeah, um, rook d1 is a, is a very is a very good positional move, hmm. and uh, after. Queen c5, right? So there's, I'm not sure what else Black can do here. He's still trying to develop. Uh, after this, you can carry on with your Queen h4 idea, the one uh -huh. that you had from earlier. And uh, now we can try to uh, play for some sort of attack. So Queen h4 at this point is is good. So we make some we make some more developing moves. Now we're mm -hmm. fully developed. The Queen went to c6 and. Uh, then what is your further plan as as white? We already did everything you wanted to do for now. So now um, what are some new ideas that you can see in this position? Clearly, the idea for me would be to go with the bishop to h6, try to swap and then make a little nice uh, knight move to g5. And if all of this fails, then I would just advance my rooks a couple of rows forward to also be part of the attack against the king. So in general, I want to attack the king now. 
Right. So that is that is the right plan. And bishop h6 is the strongest way to mm -hmm. do it. If you start right away with something like knight g5, then the knight will get pushed away. And um, so will the queen. And although this does look dangerous to, to go mm. for, it's, um, it's fairly effective for now. And uh, your pieces lose a bit of their coordination. So uh, queen... So, yeah, so bishop h6 is the mm -hmm. correct idea, trying to exchange the defender. The bishop is pretty much the only defender that black has. So that is why black tries to keep keep the bishop on h8 for now. And uh, not to let you have that, uh, that idea. So now the next move is uh, not knight g5, but instead it is, uh, again, one more move which is going to prevent black's development for a while can you try to find it oh uh i know you I wanted can to try <laughs> i know you wanted to do some some rook lifts yeah you can try to you can try to do a rook doubling rook d4 would be the move to go then but i don't know how it, it will stop black's development like that so mm, that's a bit that's what you were asking for specifically. But why go only four squares when you can go eight? Well, because I saw that clearly, but what happens if bishop goes to b7? Right, bishop can go to b7. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and then, now... Then I would double up the rooks, yeah. Double up the rooks, right? And you keep all of your mate threats. Black will oh, not be able to take damn it. at any point. And your next move, I think, is going to be queen e7. And again, there is no way to to stop any of this. Oh, boy. That is... Yeah, I don't know why I didn't see that. Funny. Yeah, yes, it's because I, I had the feeling that there's too many uh, pieces protecting, but that actually is not the case at all. Huh. Right. And uh, this is actually what happened in the game. What you said, bishop b7, rook here. So queen e7 is very hard to stop. So black has to give up at least something and uh, play this because mm -hmm. now now there's, of course, no more mate um, after queen e7. So now um, white just keeps decides to keep the pieces. And, uh, now we don't really want to make those trades once there is no mate. And um, essentially, if you just look at the position, Black is, black is all tied up uh, with barely any plan. But yeah. at the same time, it becomes kind of hard for white to really continue the attack as well because, well, black has two rooks defending for now. The key square on f7 is defended very well. And uh, white doesn't have the dark squared bishop anymore, which would be standing really nicely on h6 right now, but it got traded. And... Uh, for now, there are no crazy nine sacrifices that can happen because mm -hmm. black also has set up something here. So the knight, unfortunately, cannot move. Uh, and um, yeah, so this is the position that I've showed at the very beginning and yes. the one that you recognize after a while. So um, what do you think about this position now that you know the answer? Well, now that I know the answer, I, th I was just wondering does an engine find the move immediately like this? Because, um, I, I, yeah, I, because it is so unusual. I mean, uh, just for you at home, do you know this? Do you know the answer? We gave a lot of hints by making this being an outrageous idea and something very, very special. So the question to you is if you do not know yet or you haven't seen this position yet, which is totally fine. I even forgot about it because you see millions of positions and at one point you go like, I don't know, maybe I saw it, maybe not. But due to the specificness of this position and then it rang a bell that it was Nigel Short and I was like, yeah, he did, he did this. And we also mentioned that it is a maneuver. So there are only a couple of pieces where you can do good maneuvers here in this position now. And... Um, the main idea to checkmate the black king uh, is basically extinguished. But yeah, after all, there is one piece left which can uh, go into the attack. And that is uh, the king. That and is that, right. That how, is, how, how would you do it, Arne? I would go to h2. 
And then? Then to G3. Mm -hmm. Then to F4. Slowly go to G5. And with a smirk on my face, advance to H6. And oh, that, uh, threaten checkmate. Yeah. That is the maneuver. Um, it started uh, being called, um, I guess, the, the king walk, I guess, is mm -hmm. the official name for it. And um, it's something that you don't see very often. I'm sure that this game won many beauty prizes um, after it was played because it is a pretty special maneuver, right? Yeah. At yeah. first, you just make a waiting move, king h2, and black probably didn't suspect anything. <laughs> and, and just played also a waiting move, rook to c8. Yeah. Nothing is happening. But then after king g3, I'm pretty sure Black realized um, <laughs> that um, what was happening, but it was too late because now the king is coming and there's no way to stop him. It's from... so evil, yeah. There is no way to stop him. That is the beauty of this. Right, so it was probably better for Black to actually play this bishop c8 move earlier. Play it now. Oh. Because then it makes it more difficult to continue this king walk. But because Black lost those two important tempi because he didn't realize the idea, um, now Bishop C H is not even not even a relevant attack because the king just goes forward, and uh, and is going to checkmate. Yeah. In a few. Well, this is this was the final position of the game, and Black resigned because there was no way to stop this checkmate. Um, and yeah. It was a it was a really you know nice and historic game that will forever stay a classic a classic game because of its really interesting maneuver and mm. uh, yeah I think just the takeaway is that we need to remember to include all of our pieces in the attack because sometimes we just there might just be one piece missing from making it decisive and uh, don't forget about king activity yeah yeah excellent I'll have another example later but you can share your anecdote. Oh, I just wanted to tell uh, that G because I knew this position, at, it was a long time ago, I think. This is why I couldn't uh, immediately recognize it. Um, after, uh, I just want to place into what you just said. After I saw this position a couple of years later, there was a similar game I had. And I think it was just a blitz game or something. Like something really not worth mentioning, but... Uh, I made a king walk and I checkmated the opponent king because uh, the opponent had uh, piece less uh, anyway and was just pushing back and forth and I couldn't get in with any of my pieces. So I walked mm -hmm. in my king and then it was checkmate. So that was without this example, which we have in our head now, even if we forget at one point, we might remember. <laughs> <laughs> With, with this, uh, you get this idea of like, oh, yeah, that is also an option which you would never probably think of in, in another game. So it's always good to have those uh, lessons and those um, yeah games to just show you that's possible too, by the way. Yeah, that was my quick anecdote. No, that, that, is, that is right. That's why, that's why we do these examples in the first place, mm -hmm. so that maybe they give you some ideas in your games to, to also implement those. But exactly. um, yeah, the second example I had is I wanted to show the other side of king activity that it might not always be a good thing Oops. Uh, because as much as those examples uh, like Nigel short game, they inspire people to, you know, go out with their king and try to checkmate their opponent. <laughs> um, you know, maybe someone will be inspired to start playing the Bonk Cloud. Bonk Cloud, exactly. Go for F7 <laughs> Don't right you away. Have a course? Don't you have a course on I the have Bonk? The, I have the Fritz Trainer course. It sold tremendously well. So thank you, everybody, who bought the Fritz Trainer of the Bonk Cloud attack. Um, well, it is uh, banned shortly after um, it came out because it is just too strong of an opening. So nobody plays it, just like nobody takes uh, Sagat in Street Fighter 2. It's just like uh, just kidding for the <laughs> but there's some 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 there's some computer games where you there's a competition and you're not allowed to take this one or this 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 uh, character or so like that it is for chess now no one yeah, it's plays just, it's the bunk out too strong that people it's too strong you just give up people are offended like no nah, sorry I'm out of here yeah right so everyone should buy Arne's uh, bunk cloud lecture absolutely and yeah. It is very just to know, possible. just to know about it, even if it's banned. No. Of course, don't use it because that is too disrespectful to your opponents. Because <laughs> you just win right away, right? It's like 
Play two one zero and yeah, uh, go for the Adyakin where you push the knight back after the second moved. Right, <laughs> that is that that one is a little more respectful. Um, yeah, but uh, but that being said, even Magnus Carlsen has played the Bond Club before, and Hikaru too. Yeah, and they've right. they've they've uh, exchanged blows on on this opening. So right. what about the king activity? I'm sorry, yeah. I interrupted okay. you again. I'll, while I do the next one, actually, I was curious. Did you do your course before or after the Magnus and Hikaru game? Well, so the th OK, that's a good question, actually. And I will still quickly um, uh, answer this. I had the idea of this course for 1st of April uh, the year before. Mm -hmm. I thought, like, this is a fun idea. This is funny. And you cannot believe it, just like one and a half weeks earlier, Magnus Carlsen plays the Bon Cloud against Hikaru and they made a draw after that. So I thought, like, can you believe it? <laughs> now people will think I made it because of that. But uh, it was actually pretty perfect because it was something to talk about in that moment anyway. So that's yeah. why a lot of people thought it was pretty hilarious. So that's yeah, nice. But you, you had that idea before it was cool. So that makes it that makes it even better. Thanks. Feel better yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, this was uh, one of the games. Yeah, this mm -hmm. was this was. Um, I'm trying to show like the other side of king activity because here side. I was playing as I was playing as black, and um, oh. it was my opponent who was trying to um, to do some sort of king walk. To pull up a Nigel short here. Uh -huh. Pull up a Nigel short, but um, there are some there are some other moments in this game too, which. Um, the king maneuver isn't coming just yet. Uh, but yeah, this, so this, just to give some context, this was a game at my club in Ottawa and it was our annual club championship. So it was a pretty important event. I, I at least I took it seriously <laughs> because um, this was, um, yeah, basically this was the last round. Okay. So the fate of uh, of the tournament was being decided. And, and I was playing against um, David Gordon. He's uh, He's, he's a great, really nice guy, and he has been the club champion many times oh. for many years before. So games with him are honestly never boring. He's a very creative player. Nice, so nice. here is one example of such games. So first, I want you to take a look at this position and tell me what you think you would play as black. Hmm. I was having a bit of a crisis here, not really knowing... Uh, what it's difficult. Of course, the plan with the pushing the knight to f6 is a bit too obvious to just catch the queen on g4 because it just helps to develop white a bit uh, the pawn structure, h3 maybe, then g4. And uh, yeah, that is a bit of a dilemma. I would like to be white in this position, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, so what would black play here? It's a uh, well, maybe go for the exchange or yeah, play a bit safer and just put the rook on d8 and then the queen to f8 might be an idea. Okay, so you you mean play knight, you want to play knight of six and then knight of six is probably helping white, so I think knight of six is not good. I would play rook d8 mm -hmm. and then queen f8 and then yeah, maybe. Oh exchange the queens if possible but of course white won't yeah that is a dilemma how did you get out of this dilemma well you'll you'll see in a second but um this rook d8 and the queen f8 idea of course makes makes sense because when you see the queen on h6 you immediately want to get rid of it yeah not fun right? but but also once you take a look at that end game i'm not sure i like it for black either because how am i going to develop my bishop on c8 and now black now now white's king is actually a good thing being in the center because it's the end game True. and um and yeah honestly it's a game that i needed to play for a win and uh, the end game wasn't uh okay. wasn't really looking amazing yes i have the idea it's a beautiful sacrifice okay it's going to be e5 right and then you just well, take one of the knights and first of all you develop your you can get out your uh, bishop and then the threat of g4 is still there and there's even more happening with attacking d3 you think just like me just like i did in that game but e5 is actually a bad move oh. but <laughs> it is what i played it is what i played <laughs> um, okay so if we just take a look at the position just to like talk about it objectively it's it's around equal probably 
just more pleasant for white. And the best plan is actually not to maneuver the queen, but to maneuver the knights and play something like knight to e7, mm -hmm. turning knight f5, white, of course, is going to prevent it. Then you make some more maneuvers, knight f6, you know, knight e4, something like that. Oh. And you, you're you not really scared of what white is doing because he doesn't just have enough pieces to do to make a checkmate just yet. So yeah. you make some trades, you play this around equal, probably more pleasant I for white. I think that's really difficult to see, yeah, but uh, yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's probably not that difficult to see because you just, you know, you just remaneuver your pieces to a better squares. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I wanted something, I wanted something better. And uh, um, so basically, I was looking at uh, the fact that the king was out here in the open on F2. And um, it's kind of hard to get to it right now because the center is closed. So I got the brilliant idea of of opening up the center with e5. I mean, brilliant is, is I think in, it's brilliant. It's a great <laughs> idea. I really appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, well, um, it's. I feel like it's one of those moves that you're not sure if a complete beginner or a grandmaster played it because it's either very deep or just very stupid. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Probably the latter is uh, <laughs> what happens to me most of the times. The engine thinks it's a mistake uh, because... Um, Ugh, engines. Because yeah. uh, black can, uh, white can just take it and uh, and uh, basically so this was the idea right this was my idea and exactly, your idea yeah. what you saw you open up the pieces you make an attack on d3 on g4 it's okay. looking good um, now yeah. bishop e2 is the only move actually which is also like not uh, not that complicated to see but just so you know if white plays anything else let's say king king e2 then after rookie eight now it's black who's winning because um there's no way of stopping like some bishop g4s bishop f5s like takes knight g4s now black is actually winning so it wasn't fully it wasn't fully bluff i did calculate some things here but um <laughs> after bishop e2 uh, it becomes oh. hard after a while like f5 yes it becomes hard after a while to really do an attack because um because white has just enough pieces to defend and the king is not somewhere too too out in the open and uh, Pity. it's basically i just have a piece for i'm just down a piece for a pawn yeah I can okay maybe, i can maybe get some material back i didn't think it was so bad here i of course i saw i saw this and i thought okay maybe i have some chances but uh but yeah it was um According to the engine, it was just a horrible position. Uh, so, so yeah. But actually, my opponent ended up playing, uh, replying to my brilliant idea with his own brilliant idea of uh, an exchange sacrifice on rook c6. <laughs> and just so you know, we're not, it's not like we were some, like, uh, this game might look like some complete beginners played it, which wasn't the case we were playing for the club championship but uh but still it's like um sacrifice after sacrifice but we were both calculating a lot here and mm -hmm. there's some sense to it although it it looks like there isn't but there is some sense to it and then you played queen takes a3 no no <laughs> championship of sacrifices sacrifices are done here um yeah but obviously he should have just taken my my sacrifice but actually that happens sometimes it's one more of those psychological things yeah. of where um sometimes bluff like this works but you know it's like there's a i think there's a saying that for people to believe your lies then there needs to be at least like um 40 or 30 percent of truth in it <laughs> so this is kind of one of those things for people to believe your uh your sacrifice your uh, dubious sacrifice, let's say, yeah. there needs to be at least some lines where it works. And then maybe they, you know, they calculate that line and then they trust you in all the other lines that, okay, they calculated it, it probably works. But of course, this <laughs> this isn't um, this isn't as bad as it, as it looks. Of course, there are some nuances in those, in uh, what arises later, but, uh, but still, this was a classical game. We played it full, fully seriously, and uh, to tell you the yeah, truth, if I, trusted, trusted if I would be I... white, I would try also the same thing. I would, I think it would, I, I, I would be threatened. I would think like uh, this is this is difficult, and this is why this always, uh, yeah. 
Right. Like someone plays e5, it's obviously intentional that they're yeah. putting a uh, putting a pawn under under two attacks and uh, yeah. But then you calculate and then you just think like, nah, it's not so nice. And then if you calculate that, if you take the knight on c6, then you should be having enough pieces to still maybe have better control for white. Right. Beyond, yeah. Rook c6, uh, like it has some it. sense. Right, because you then you yeah. gain back some material and uh, and yeah. So um, actually, actually, yeah. Actually, at this point, uh, I was apparently not done with the sacrifices. I could have, <laughs> I could have just, I could have just moved the queen away. Had you know, like material. I think I'm up a pawn technically, but it doesn't feel yeah. like it because my pieces aren't developed. But okay, material maybe roughly equal. Whatever, just play this position and enjoy your um, being, having having a rook uh, for a knight. But no, I was I wasn't done. And, uh, and again, I did again, <laughs> I completely understand you. I would have done the same. Seriously, yeah. it looks. I mean, you're getting two pawns. There's a third one. Maybe you have. It looks positionally better, and I guess I'm sure that every engine and every super title to grandmaster will probably go like and uh, uh, just uh, yeah destroy destroy the plants easily but i i get it to a certain i i, I understand why this, this was this was actually in my attacking phase when i <laughs> that i told you about when no i would way. when i would really sacrifice when i would just sacrifice yeah. everything and uh, yeah well it i mean it this this kind of uh uh, with this approach, I, I won the the club championship, you know. But still, but still, it's not something I would recommend to everyone. But it's an interesting phase to go through. I feel like uh, <laughs> if you're someone who was always um, a very calm player who never really like going for attacks, I feel like it's something worth trying out. Just to kind of not thinking about material as much as you did, uh, as you did before, and just seeing seeing how it how it goes for you. But of course, not. Yeah, I, I think I probably I threw the pieces around way too much, and uh, it was not always good. But uh, you're not you're never playing against engines, so if there is at least uh, some sense to your sacrifices, then trust me, some of them will actually will actually work. And sacrifices just make life more interesting. So and, I don't see why not. And you made this very very good point uh, that it is always good to open the horizon and even if it's the exact counter thing you would ever play in a chess game why not be brave enough and just go the complete opposite for a while it doesn't have to be forever and maybe you i mean you can if you if you do this intentionally you will only learn uh, new and good things from this so and i'm pretty sure when you had this attacking and sacrificing phase uh, this was a lot of beneficial uh, uh, things you learned from this anyway so yeah uh, the knight e5 good one the knight is gone right <laughs> both of my knights are gone yes uh, but huh. uh, but it's we are in an interesting position where now uh white retreated to g3 because if you go to like any other direction, then you're blocking the rook, and uh, and after and after that, the king the king is really mm -hmm. not feeling safe if it goes if it goes to any of those squares. So basically, king g three was I think one of the only defenses. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't think I don't think other things work out as well. So king king goes to g three, and uh, yeah, this is. Um, almost uh, almost as far as the as the king march that we saw in the first game so um i got gotcha. you because uh, at the moment with the king to g3 the knight is taboo on b3 but if the king would go on the last row then you can just take out the knight and give a check and come back just in time probably to uh, exactly. avoid a yeah, checkmate so for example the king let's say the king is on f1 right take here and then we have this move oh actually even oh gosh yeah even just, that's even, even better just this. i didn't even see I that was gonna yeah, yeah. Say, i was gonna say we have this defense yes and we defend the checkmate but yeah we even we can just take the bishop yeah that's and, even nicer yeah so um so yes so now that the king is here 
Um, queen cannot take on b3, of course, because after knight g5, um, there is no defense against the mate on h7. Unfortunate. So this is why I could not take the knight. Um, and I had to play something else like f5. So now, to clarify, the queen, while the queen is still on this diagonal, it can still come back to g7 and uh, make a defense if the knight is ever coming to g5. Oops. So now white is trying to block it block that diagonal uh and um oh. i'm trying to get back on it so <laughs> where would you move the king you basically have two options so which way would you go to the king f2 or the king h4 way yeah well i'm i mean i'm sorry but it's already uh in in this uh, task of uh showing us that a king uh, run can also or, or or the king walk can also go wrong so i obviously would go to f2 at the moment um h4 doesn't look as bad for me but it probably is terrible um it's not terrible but okay. king f2 is way safer mm -hmm. um yeah because you can just because stay there on f2 safer, yeah. and um and yeah, just have a just have a safer um, a safer a safer king there because h4 it's not horrible it's black, white is not getting mated or anything like that okay. but it's not quite as clear of a route as it was in the Nigel short game right because okay the king gets to g5 and and then what yeah it's uh, nothing is really happening here uh, but I get I get why it it looks it looks fairly safe though. to yes. be honest for now it looks fairly safe it's covered by the knight with the queen can defend it so it's not in a in a sense that uh, white is going to get checkmated but in a sense that on f2 was just way safer and simpler mm -hmm. and um, and yeah h4 is not that necessary but it's still I think it's one of the like one of the only games that I at least remember from recent games where the king ended up all the way on h4. That is something, uh, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't happen that often. So um, how would you evaluate this position then? What do you think is mm. should be the objective evaluation? So difficult, but there are three white uh, minor pieces on the king side or can maybe be activated even a bit better so i can show you a few more moves of what happened we actually yeah. had a queen trade happening and maybe oh. we can evaluate it after that so some okay. moves were made and okay oh. great let's try to evaluate this so now since the queen trade has happened i th i have the feeling that black has some good pawns on c and d which might be helping each other then we have uh normally you say like um yeah the the minor pieces two minor pieces against the rook are uh, in most cases better but here i don't see the big advantage anymore and at least the mate threats i can also not see so probably black uh, can can get out of this quite well yeah um i think the position should be around equal maybe black is slightly easier to play because of better chances of mm -hmm. pushing pushing your pawns forward um but yeah so the the point is thinking is the king even good on h4 anymore right usually after we do those huge like you're right yeah king, um king maneuvers we would want a queen trade because because then your king is in the center, and that's a great thing for the end yeah. game, but not a great thing for the middle game. But here, the king on h4 actually doesn't <clears throat> doesn't really have a clear route to come back to where the action is going with those pawns moving forward. So it will take quite some time for white to actually get back with the king, and the king probably would rather be on f2 right now than on uh, than on h4. Yes, much much likely. At the moment, there's only two moves. It's in front of his pawns. No, it is actually really bad there. That is the thing I didn't evaluate, and that is important to evaluate, of but course. But it is not obvious when you did, mm -hmm. you know, back like five moves ago when he yeah. was playing it, and it was it was a very brave decision, and um, and it does it could have it would could have worked out quite well if he had a way to continue to continue his attack for longer. Gotcha. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, but yeah, so here is um, here is the end game now, and. Uh, 
I can show how the rest of it went. Yes. Um, now the king on h4 was, uh, I even Oops. had some, some threats. threats. Yeah. So I did give a few tempi to uh, get my pieces into the game. And uh, it took white some time to actually bring it back. So here we were already in time trouble. So let's hmm. uh, probably not a lot of it was the most accurate moves, but actually it was no, it's still it's still it's still oh. pretty okay. There were some few crazy trades happening, uh, <laughs> and uh, had white found something like rook e seven, which is actually quite nice because now you're you I can't take the bishop because of knight e, knight, yeah, going, yeah. knight going to e5 right had black had white found something like rook e7 it becomes quite difficult for me to find a defense against knight e5 and then I'm in some sort of like almost a mate like, yeah true like g4 knight knight e5, like I don't That's know I'm in tough. almost a mate um, net but uh, yeah luckily that did not happen and no it, Trading works is, like makes perfect sense. Rookie seven was a bit was yeah. a bit fancy. Um, so yeah, actually, Difficult. after these few trades, do you remember we did a lesson on imbalances too? Actually, yeah. against pieces against a rook. So do you remember which one is better to have in an end game? Uh, in an end game, oh god, it's so embarrassing. But I would say uh, the rook has a bit more more uh, options. Mm-hmm. Because it right. can, if you have pawns accompanied with your rook, yeah. Then... But here it looks. Here I would say this might be again an exception of the rule because it. How can you push forward the pawns easily here? It looks difficult. Yeah, pushing the pawns is difficult, and objectively, <laughs> I mean, it's, it should be dead equal. I think because if I can't push my pawns, he can't push his pawns. Yeah. Then yeah. it would just. I think objectively, this is this is, should be quite an equal position, but I would prefer to have the rook still because um, it helps it helps me with pawn pushing. And it is right. You remembered the rule correctly that in an end game, a rook and pawns is usually preferable over two pieces compared to the middle game where two pieces can actually be a lot more help in an attack than a rook yep. can, be, can be helpful. So, um, so yeah, this should be dead equal, but uh, he soon made uh, made a decisive mistake in time trouble and he actually um he blockaded my pawns but he let one of them one of them go <laughs> and uh, uh yeah i think a, probably a better blockade would be would be different knight, knight d4 is fine but then but then going to f4 is probably is probably what's giving me some more chances. It's still not lost, I believe, but it's giving me some more chances. And um, eventually, I actually my pawn actually passed. So g4 was the decisive mistake. Oh, uh, okay. Because yeah, it was he had to go back immediately to to get the pawn, uh, and I don't think he realized I could play rook c8 before pushing c2, and now c2 wins because i either i either promote or i take the bishop oh that is nice so the even king, the king, the king goes catch here it. yeah right you play king to e5 exactly and the knight has to go which means the bishop will lose its defender yeah so this it was just hard for harder for him to calculate in time trouble than you know than it was for me to just look at pawn pushing moves mm -hmm. so i do think that in an end game it, um if we're talking about two pieces against a rook and pawn or a rook and two pawns i think it's easier to play with the rook and two pawns but of course it depends on the type of position and if those pawns are even moving forward because if they aren't then that can be an exception mm -hmm. so this uh after this questionable game I actually this this was the game that made me the club champion that that year. Not um, bad at all. Yeah, well, I actually I shared first with one other person, mm -hmm. um, but uh, but yeah, it was it was still nice. The next year in twenty twenty, I won clear first, and uh, that was that was better. I think someone even dug up the fact that it was the only time or it was the first time that um, that a woman has won. Uh, a large city like club championship 
in, nice. in Canada. Um, because we, we have quite a few quite a few big cities, but um, but I don't at least uh, at least not uh, in in those large clubs. They don't. I don't. I don't think it has happened before. But I haven't fact checked it. But someone someone did do did do that for me. And uh, <laughs> if it is true, it's it's an it's a nice thing to know. So yeah, this um, game, as you could tell, wasn't probably the best quality, but at least uh, it was interesting. And that's one of the things I really like about chess is that it's uh, it's not always about uh, about what the engine thinks is best. It's also just if uh, if if the game is interesting, that's that's what you play chess for. You don't play it to always always play perfect perfect games. Although some people would probably disagree. I but... couldn't agree more. So yeah, I mean that's the main reason I play chess. It's because of the beauty of creativity and all of this. And yeah, it yeah. doesn't lead to uh, yeah, as you just pointed it out mm -hmm. perfectly well. Yeah. Right. I also sometimes notice that uh, you can uh, unshare the screen, by the way. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, I also sometimes notice that it's uh, not your best games that bring you the best results. Like sometimes uh, you think you played well, but somehow you're not winning your games and it's not working out. But then when you uh, when you make some sort of uh, crazy sacrifices and somehow works out and, you know, brings you good results. Um, yeah. You ever have that uh, all the time yeah. non-stop but yeah. it is uh yeah and this is yeah it this is this i i'm not sure i mean uh i'm learning a lot from from your lessons and also by um that that it is good to to change the the mindset sometimes in chess and maybe go for defending a bit more, which I've done recently. It didn't work that well, but I got better in it and also in end games, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so this is it's always helpful to to get facets from all the different kinds of ways how you can play chess and which is also a big, big part of the beauty because there's so many different ways mm -hmm. and how chess can be uh, exciting and interesting and nice. And people do it for the most different reasons. There's the math, there's the positional play, and uh, there's the aggressive playing and all of that. And uh, yeah. The more, yeah. The more I play, the more I realize the all the different aspects of it. And the more I realize the, actually how important psychology also is. And this is why mm. I sometimes like tell you all of these uh, things that it's sometimes not the most objective move uh, is the most practical one and uh, and th and things like that so yeah yeah it uh, it depends and there are a lot a lot of uh, interesting aspects of chess to to look at and uh, absolutely and your horizons yeah you people at home, I hope you enjoyed it and could stay with us, although was, this was an XXL episode with over one hour of content, but uh, it was uh, very, very nice lessons from you. Thank you so much. Um, glad you're back, Svetlana. And um, everybody else, I wish you a lovely week and we see each other next time. Bye bye.